Thank you all of you for coming for the Doma. Um, all the schools are holidays, we wish we could declare holiday here also. But unfortunately, don't have that privilege. So, rain, no rain, sun, rain, sun, we all come. So, thank you for making a point of coming early morning for the Doma. We are happy that we have a very important topic for us. A lot of things happening on the cancer areas. Many of us may not be keeping in touch with it and so we are very happy that Dr. Ashish Singh is here to take the sessions on pancreatic biliary, hepatocellular, upper GI cancers. <laughs> he was lost, what do you want me to speak? Each one may be depth in itself and yet I was just saying that understanding principles of oncology, how do we approach, how do we manage, I am sure he will know how to put it all together. So once again thank you Ashish for being here early morning. Despite them having busy schedules, they have taken an out time for all of you to give you an overview about uh, uh, the upper GI cancers. So over to you. Good morning. Thank you for being here. So when, when Jennifer asked me that we want you to talk about common cancers, so that's the first question I had was, okay, what is it what you regularly diagnose, right? So now being, uh, being internal medicine uh, residents and faculty, you would uh, probably have patients who are coming with vague symptoms, right? And, and, and that's how they'll end up to your OPD. And, uh, and, and, and that's how you finally come to a diagnosis of most of the GI symptoms because it's happening inside the abdomen. GI cancers because it's evolving inside the abdomen. They do not manifest with lumps outside, right? As like breast or head and neck or other things. So, so, I, uh, and we have, we have discussed, I think if you go on to your YouTube channel, we have discussed uh, lung cancers in the past and, all, and, and that is there for you all to see. So, we thought this time let's, let's talk about uh, things below the diaphragm. Uh, so, we have limited time and, and this, is, this is vast. As Sir said, I want to give you a, a concept, uh, uh, an approach on what do you do when you think that your patient in the ward may be having uh, one of these cancers, right? And uh, so I, I know, I know, like I've been uh, where you people are. So, like at, when I was a resident uh, in in B ward, C ward, or E ward, we would make a diagnosis the moment we see a lump on the, I mean, a mass on the CT scan, we would not know what to do, and we will just send a referral. But patients will be asking you morning and evening. Uh, so, what is it expected? What is going to happen? Uh, uh, where is the tumor? Is it a tumor? Is it a cancer? What is it? So. Of those four diseases, what we'll do is we'll just discuss one disease for 10 minutes and then maybe we will break. We'll take your, whatever questions you have, uh, I mean, feel free to just ask uh, and, um, and let's have a, as interactive a discussion as possible. So when you talk about HPB malignancies, uh, we're actually dealing with the biliary tree and biliary tree, you know, uh, com consists of different organs, different organs which may have different origins and and even the cancers arising in them may not behave the same way as, as we all know it. So, so if you talk about liver, hepatocellular carcinoma, as you know, is a totally different problem. Pancreatic cancer is different. And then you have biliary tract starting right, the way, right from inside the intrahepatic uh, uh, biliary system to the gallbladder to, and to the, uh, to the extrahepatic uh, biliary system. So now when we talk, so today's class, when we talk about HPB cancers, one thing we, I want to highlight is that uh, it's in terms of survival, when you look at incidence and survival, we are talking about cancers which actually are on, on, your, on your right, uh, which is, they have one of the worst survivals possible in, in, in terms of all the cancers. So if you see on the left, if you have testicular cancer, thyroid cancers, prostate cancers, of all the people diagnosed, more than 70% of them don't die of the disease. But if you have, if you have lung, uh, if you have esophagus, liver, pancreatic, gallbladder, the number of people who actually live after a diagnosis is about, is only about less than 20 percent. And uh, so, so it, this is because of different challenges we have in this disease, which we will discuss. Also, the, the thing to uh, worry about is, if you look, these are projections in the next uh, 20 years. Uh, so, if you see that in terms of incidence and mortality, uh, even though the incidence of some of the cancers are coming down, the incidence of HPV cancers are projected to rise. If you look at the pink line, that's, that's the breast cancer incidence. Even though breast cancer incidence is projected to rise, but the mortality is not rising. Mortality is actually in fact coming down. 
But on the other hand, if you have an HPB cancer, which is, uh, which is the green line, if you see the green line, actually the, both the incidence and the mortality is going to go up and you're going to see more and more patients with this. Now, pancreatic cancer, you all know is, uh, how does it present? I'm not going to go into all that. You know how does it present? You, I'm sure you all have seen the pancreatic cancers, right? Depends on, depends on what are the risk factors, depends on where the disease is arising. Usually a pancreatic cancer is a disease of the older people, right? They, most of the time they are asymptomatic actually, even the tumor is early. And they have usually weight, weight loss, uh, dyspepsia, and, uh, and then by the time they develop symptoms, if, 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 if the tumor is in the head, head region, what happens is usually the biliary system gets obstructed and that itself presents uh, as jaundice and that's how they come. But if the tumor is not in the head region, if it's in the body or the tail region, it by the time you develop pain, that, that, that tells you that the tumor is already infiltrating your surrounding nerves or surrounding uh, or, or, the, or the bone or the, or, the t or the tissue outside the organ, that's not a good sign. Now, now the outcome in this disease of whatever patients you're going to cure is entirely dependent on whether you can resect it completely, right? And whether you can resect it completely or not depends on where the tumor is sitting and what it is infiltrating. And if you see the anatomy of this, so you have your arteries, the celiac trunk, the superior mesenteric artery, and then you have your veins, which is again the portal vein and the superior mesenteric vein. And then if the tumor is distal, maybe then you also have the iota. So, so when you do a CT scan, and that is all the patients should have a CT scan, not a PET scan or, or anything like that. Sometimes you may also need an MRI because the vascular anatomy may be better delineated on MRI. And that's extremely important because resectable or not resectable is defined based on its, its relation to the vessels. And if you see here, borderline resectable will be something which is which is uh, encircling the superior mesenteric artery less than 180 degree. So if you imagine in a cross section and the tumor engulfing the vessel, if it's within 180 degree, then the surgeon is maybe, is, will be willing to go and attempt. If it's more than 180 degree, the surgeons would say, ah, you can't sacrifice your, your, your celiac trunk or superior mesenteric artery, so it becomes inoperable. So this is something which is extremely important. And one of the reasons why this disease has such a poor prognosis is because by the time the patient presents to you and you do your CT scan, only about 20% of these patients actually have resectable disease, right? So the other day I asked Dr. Ravish, how many whipples do you do per year? And the number is small. That's because even though we diagnose a lot of pancreatic cancer, the people who fit into that resectability criteria is low. And even in those 20% when you do the whipples, what proportion of them actually are disease free three years from then, five years from them? That number is even pretty low, so I mean only, only about 30%. So overall, that's the reason why this disease has such a high uh, uh, mortality. Now, if you have, so let, now let's next five, 10 minutes, I'll just quickly tell you how, as a medical oncologist, as a medical doctor, when a patient comes with this disease, and if he's lucky enough to have surgery and then he comes to you, what do you tell him, right? So you have a disease, you are staring at a disease which has a very high relapse rate. He'll ask you, what is, it, what is my cure rate, right? So, so again, uh, the, I mean, most of the patients want to do their best, right? They want to do, they want to take the best available treatment, whether it's chemotherapy, whether it's radiation therapy, whether it's immunotherapy or whatever they, you want to do. First thing they'll ask you is, can you predict whether I'll do well or not well? That depends predominantly on, on the TNM stage, right? The larger the tumor, the node involvement, poorly differentiated tumor have an inferior outcome. Also whether the surgery was R0 or R1. You know what is R0 and R1? It depends at the margin, right? So the, when the surgeon has removed the tumor, for pancreatic cancer, the most important margin is actually the retroperitoneal margin, where, where, where they have to go behind. Behind the pancreas, what is there? Pancreas itself is a retroperitoneal organ. Behind the pancreas is just some fascia and then the, and, and the muscle and the bone, right? So that margin is usually which is, which a skilled surgeon has to be very good over there. Also another prognostic factor is if you have persistently elevated CA 19.9 even after surgery, those patients don't do well. The thing about CA 19.9 is most of the time when you have biliary obstruction, the level is not reliable, that level will be high. 
So I see a lot of the time you send CA 19.9 somebody who is obviously jaundiced. Even if he doesn't have a cancer, he'll, his levels will be high. So, so that's not very reliable then. But postoperatively, rare, yes. Now, so when he comes to you, I mean, most of the time you know it's a systemic disease is going to come back in the liver or local or in the in the retroperitoneum. So you we need to have we need to treat them with some drugs, right? And the until 2004, actually, we did not have any any substantial evidence that doing anything helps. 2004, we saw a trial where, where, where they showed that giving 5-FU, 5-fluorouracil, right, 5-fluorouracil actually improves outcomes. And this 5-fluorouracil is a very, uh, very interesting drug. You can give it in, in, in bolus form, you can give it in an infusion form, and you can give it both infusion and bolus. And depending on how you give it, its mechanism of action is different, right? You can all go read up on your Satoskar or your books. And, and, and it's for, for, the, for the last few years, it was only 5-FU. Then came a drug called gemcitabine. Now, the gemcitabine is also an antimetabolite. The advantage of gemcitabine is it's less toxic. It's a 30 minutes infusion given every week. And, and that was shown to be equally good as 5-FU. Then as time has gone by, uh, we, we, uh, that, uh, I mean, we, have, we got what we call capecitabine, which is a pro-drug for 5-FU. So basically the most important drug in any GI cancer is 5-FU and its derivatives. That's what you need to remember. And then recently, for the last, five, last 10 years or so, people have tried giving combinations. So the, 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 this trial which I am showing you is, a, is called SPAC4 where they use both gemcitabine and capecitabine. And if you look at those Kaplan-Meier curves, you can see that people who got this combination, their survival was improved, right? And, uh, and then, off late, and just in 2018, people have given three drugs together. These are all patients who had surgery and come to you. So the three drugs they have given is irinotecan, oxaliplatin, and 5-FU. So it's a triplet, right? So those of you who have come to medical oncology, you know, you know these folfirinox and folfox. I'm not using that term, even though Jennifer knows what it is and, 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 and Nitin knows what it is. But it's basically a combination of irinotec and oxaliplatin 5-FU. So, so, when you, so what I'm trying to say is if you add two or three drugs, your outcomes improve, but so does toxicity, right? The challenge here is when they have surgery and come, many of them are frail, many of them are older people, and they do not, they, they cannot tolerate this. So that's the reason. But then if you're able to deliver, see this Kaplan makeup clearly shows you, if you're able to deliver these three drugs, your survival is much better than just giving one drug. Now, because these people are frail and, and unable to tolerate these toxic treatments after surgery, there's a lot of interest and focus shifting to giving this treatment before surgery. That is what we call neoadjuvant therapy. And in neoadjuvant therapy, what you will do is, because these are fitter patients, you can deliver these three drugs together. Okay, so there is a trial called Priopang. This is a large phase three trial. They've given this chemotherapy before. In this case, it was gemcitabine. But then there are a lot of other trials which are giving all folfirinox, that is all the three drugs together. Some of them are even giving radiation therapy before because local failure is a problem in this disease. Whether radiation therapy improves outcomes in this disease, it is, it is not clear yet. As of now, radiation is, con is, is only limited to diseases which are inoperable, which are like if your SME is totally encased or the disease will not, never be resectable even in those patients. But for resectable patients, when they did the chemotherapy before, there is a uh, lot of trials have actually shown better outcomes. But again, the, the, the large trials have not yet been completed. So it is, if you go center to center, surgeon to surgeon, there is a variation, right? Even now here, we are, try, we are kind of moving towards giving treatment early, provided the patient is not jaundiced. If the patient is jaundiced, then you put in a stent, drain the biliary system and give this treatment early three months of treatment, get a date for surgery and then do surgery. That's another challenge. These are very specialized surgeries, right? Very few centers in the country actually can do a Whipples, right? And, and, and there are too many patients. So, and also the dates are not available. If you go today and ask for a date for Whipples, you'll get it in April. Patients cannot wait till April. So, so don't, don't, I mean, when you refer a patient, don't say go and then get surgery and come back. You should say, you should come back and tell me when your surgery is. And it's your duty to do something in that period so that the disease doesn't increase. Now, now, in spite of all these, a lot of patients will fail, right? And you develop metastatic disease or, or the 80% of your patients where you diagnose metastatic disease upfront, what do you do for them? 
right? So again, here, same drugs, gemcitabine, if you use it, it, it improves survival and it may even be better than 5-FU. These are all older studies and if you see the kaplan may curves, by the time it's 8 months, 12 months, they're all like, so that's the median survival in, in metastatic disease. But, but we have built on, I mean, these are, these are the studies in the 90s, but if you see from then onwards, uh, from then onwards, as, 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 as you saw in the adjuvant state, there's a drug called MAP paclitaxel, which is paclitaxel in an albumin bound fashion, which you can combine with gemcitabine. And when you do that, with that you have your median survivals. This is median, so that's 50%, right? Uh, so median survival in the tune of 8 months to 11 months, right? And, and, and 2 or 3 years survival is still pretty dismal. So, so that was in a nutshell what, what we have with chemotherapy drugs and, and outcomes and how we approach. Is there anything new? So now you know this is an era of genomic medicine, right? Precision medicine. So sometimes pancreatic cancer, if you, if you actually take the tumor and do an NGS and sequence the entire genome, what are you likely to see? Are you likely to see common mutations in which all genes, right? So, so pancreatic cancer, the most common mutation you'll see is KRAS, SMAD, P53. These are all, these are all oncogenes which are like universal, very common, but very difficult to target. A small fraction of these patients can actually have germline BRCA mutation or a PALB2 mutation. These are genes, you all know BRCA from breast cancer, ovarian cancer. These are genes which are involved in DNA repair pathways. And then you can actually target these mute, uh, alteration or mutation with PARP inhibitors. You know PARP inhibitors? PARP is, what is PARP stands for? Biochemistry days, PARP repairs the DNA. Polyadenosine. Okay, so you look it up. So, there, so, there are, so this PARP actually can be targeted. It's an enzyme which is involved in DNA repair. And in people who lack BRCA gene, there if you block this enzyme, the cell dies, right? So it's like a, it's like a, it's like a, uh, it's like a molecularly targeted therapy. We have three of them, Olaparib, Rucaparib, Talazoparib. And this is a trial where patients with, uh, with pancreatic cancer, after chemotherapy, they were randomized to Olaparib, or no treatment and then you show the improvement in survival. Okay, so in summary, pancreatic cancer is a difficult to treat disease. We have about three or four drugs which we use and, and I try to show you how to use, how do you position. Genomically targeted therapy, it's still evolving and uh, as of now, the only approval we have is for PARP inhibitors in patients who have this, right? So that's pancreatic cancer and any doubt, any, any discussion? Yes. So, so is it is it is it correct to give chemotherapy before surgery? Now, so neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Actually, historically, if you see which all cancers we use neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we use it for osteosarcoma, we use it for breast cancer, we use it for gastric cancer. The way it is evolved is actually entirely for this reason. In osteosarcoma, people wanted time to, to make those implants. So they sent for chemotherapy, right? Now, randomized trials have shown that if you give chemo before or you give chemo later, the outcomes are the same. We have it, and, and, and in some cancers, especially GI cancers where, like gastric cancers, 30 to 40% of patients would not be fit for chemo later, right? And this disease is systemic disease right from day one. Even on the scan, you're seeing only a pancreatic head mass. 30% of them will develop liver meds in the next scan, right? So, so there is no detriment in giving chemotherapy upfront. On the other hand, if chemotherapy produces a response, it may actually improve your local resection. It may improve your R0 resection rates. It may make, uh, it may make, uh, it, it, um, symptoms may go away. And the most important thing is you're treating a patient where he is fit to receive treatment. So the concern is, will the tumor progress? Will I miss out on a surgery? Right? So those concerns, that's why we do randomized trials. And as of now, whatever randomized trials we have done, it has not shown any detriment. The progression do happen. I mean, maybe 20% patients will progress. But then 20% patient, patients also relapse within three months of surgery. So that's just the biology. And not, and not uh, there's no detriment in terms of, uh, if you look at two-year survival or three-year survival.
Okay, anything? So these drugs may be new for you, that's because you don't use it, right? You've not written it, you've not written orders, you've not administered. So when you come to medical oncology, so you would all, you will all definitely, definitely be more familiar with it and, and you'll, 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 when you use it, you know how, how, what is the toxicities and how you manage. Okay, so quickly now we'll go to biliary tract cancer. Now when, by biliary tract cancer, this is supposedly a rare disease. By rare means if you look at incidence, incidence across the world is actually much lesser than many other common cancers. But being in India, we are actually a home for carcinoma of the gallbladder. I don't know how many of you have been to North India. I mean, when I was a medical student, I went to Ruxol for my, com for my uh, community medicine posting and, and all in the OPD I saw was gallbladder cancers and all I did was ascitic taps, right? So if you see the Ganges belt, it's, 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 it's so common there. And, and, and we still don't know why is it common, but there are certain parts of the world where, especially the, uh, the Egypt and those countries where it is very common. And this is, I'm talking about only gallbladder, but again, biliary tract disease is not one disease. Okay, uh, and, and the reason why I say these are different is because at the molecular level they are different. So I don't know if you can read from there. When you sequence these tumors, uh, if you see the bottom part, the kind of mutations they have is different, right? And also when you come down to the ampullary cancers, some of them can actually be even pancreatic type, some of them can also actually be even be intestinal types. Now all these things is pathology, molecular pathology. What bearing does it have on treatment? We are still learning, but, but the most important thing you have to figure out is that these patients, unlike pancreatic cancers, they present early. They present early because they have jaundice and they have symptoms. And again here treatment is surgery. Treatment is surgery and, and surgery here depends on which all segments are involved. Whether it, it has to be a hepatectomy uh, or it has to be a segmentectomy. And like all, all cancer surgeries, the surgeons would not only have to go after the tumor, but he also have to go after the draining lymphatics, which will be the perihilar node. And the dissection can go all the way up to all the nodes above the renal artery, depending on how the fit, how fitness of the patient and the expected outcomes. Now, after surgery is done, Right? After surgery is done, then again, what should be the adjuvant therapy? Now, now many times, if the margins are close in the liver or at the hilum, where you can't get a big margin or if it's positive, though they, they all fail locally. So if you look at this one, red is what, uh, I mean, this is, this is just a difference between ampullary cancer, gallbladder cancer and cholangiocarcinoma. So if you see the pattern of failure, your cholangiocarcinomas fail mainly in the liver. On the other hand, your gallbladder cancers and your ampullary cancers, they have distant failure. So this also has bearings on, on your adjuvant therapy. So if you have a cholangiocarcinoma which is very close margin, I may ask my radiation therapy colleague that, that you, do you want to do concurrent radiation along with my systemic therapy? On the other hand, for a gallbladder or an ampullary, we would say no. Okay, uh, a close margin, may not just mean local recurrence because this patient may even fail distally. Now here again, the drug we use is capecitabine, right? You remember that. So capecitabine, as I told you, is, is, is a, is a pro-drug for 5-fluorouracil. It's an oral drug, right? And, uh, and patients take it 14 days on, one week off, and the duration of treatment is six months. And it's been shown that people who do not take, uh, people who take only three months or four months have inferior outcomes. Also what's important is when you start these treatment, usually adjuvant treatment should be started within the first three months, that is 120 days. It's also been shown that if you, de if you delay starting treatment after three months, the outcomes are inferior. And these, this is just trials comparing giving capecitabine versus not giving capecitabine and you see that, that there's about 5 or 7% extra people you can cure when you give this treatment. Gemcitabine, which is, which is commonly used for pancreatic cancer, has not been shown to be that useful in biliary tract cancer, in adjuvant situation, when you've done surgery. So that is something which you need to remember. And also, like in, pancre like in pancreatic cancer, people have tried to use multiple combinations. Those trials are still ongoing. As of now, like there is this trial going on which is comparing cisplatin gemcitabine versus capecitabine. 
this is still ongoing, but as of now, the only benefit, only positive trial which we have is the BILCAP trial, and based on that, we use Cape Cytobine and Gem Cytobine for biliary tract cancer. Now, again, most of these patients would, by the time they present to you, they have advanced disease, right? So, for advanced disease, the standard treatment up front is a combination of cisplatin with Gem Cytobine. Now, cisplatin, you know, is a platinum compound. The other platinum compound you can use is oxaliplatin and the, how you choose between the two is based on the patient's renal functions, patient's performance status, cardiac status, neuropathy and hearing, right? So anybody with a low GFR, poor performance status, pre-existing neuropathy or hearing problem is unfit for cisplatin and we would use oxaliplatin. Now cisplatin is a, probably a little better drug, gives you bit good survival but also toxic. So, when, when, when your goal of treatment is palliation, many times we trade off a little bit lesser survival but better quality of life and, and you may go for oxaliplatin. So, but then what uh, the thing to remember is cisplatin gemcitabine is your common, is your uh, go-to therapy. Now, here uh, again addition of NAP paclitaxel seems to add to responses whether how much it improves survival, those trials are still ongoing, right? Unlike in pancreatic cancer, in biliary tract cancer, giving three drugs has not been shown to be that advantageous as compared to pancreatic cancer. And once your patients progress on cisplatin gemcitabine, what do you do? I mean, I mean, usually what happens is these drugs, you give it for four months, six months, and then you give them a break. Okay, give them, give them chemotherapy holidays or, or a treatment-free interval so that they can recover and once on the subsequent scans you show that disease is increasing again, you may decide to treat them again. And you can use other drugs which you have not used earlier, right? Like if you use cisplatin, you, here you can use oxaliplatin or you can use arenotecan. And, and that's, how, that's how you do. There is a concept of maintenance treatment which some people do, some people don't do because the impact on survival is still uh, not that, that, that clear. So maintenance treatment is usually done if, if you have a young fit patient who can tolerate and who is at high risk of progression if you give them a holiday. So, uh, and now with, with oral drugs like capecitabine and, uh, or even some of the other drugs, I don't know if you've heard of a drug called tegafuracil, okay, or, or a drug called gemeracil, oteracil. So, these are all same class of drugs which you can use uh, with less toxicity orally. You all know about irinotecan. There is, a, there is a modification of that irenotecan in a nanosomal form. Like you have nanosomal amphotericin B. Similarly, we have a nanosomal chemotherapy drug which is called, nanosom it's called nanosomal, uh, liposomal irenotecan. This also can be used in this disease, right? So, so if, you, if you see here, uh, in later lines, as I, told, as I talked to you about that this tumor also is heterogeneous, you can have a lot of molecular alteration. Why do we need to look for all these molecular alteration is because there are drugs which you can use to target these molecular alteration. Now the common mutations which you usually find, I think I have slides on them, I'll just quickly uh, show you. Yes, this is common mutations which you can usually find. Uh, okay, so like you take uh, 100 uh, uh, tumors and sequence them, so depending on if you have a gallbladder cancer, so if you see the common will be TP53 followed by this is ERBB23, this is HER2, which is same HER2 in breast cancer. Then you have your KRAS, you have CDKN4. So each of these, I mean, when I was at your level, I used to wonder why are they doing all these things, who, who remembers these things? But now you realize that for each of these alterations, there are at least 10 to 20, I mean, there are only hundreds of drugs in the pipeline. At the lab based level, at the tumor level, and, and in phase one, phase two trials, so if you, if you know, if you see now, KRAS can be targeted, HER2 can be targeted, uh, even, even uh, this IDH, NTREC, they all can be targeted. And when I say can be targeted means those outcomes actually are better than what you get with chemotherapy in terms of uh, tolerance and in terms of responses. And I'll just show you some of them. Uh, some of them as of now what is available for use. Uh, the IDH, FGFR3, HER2, BRAF, so these are all these are all mutations which are pretty common. Uh, the percentages are over there. When I say common, it's like 15 to 20 percent. And uh, if you see here, this is a this is a randomized trial where an IDH1 inhibitor, evocidinib, was given, and 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 compared to placebo, and you see those patients are living better. And and the thing about these mutations are they are not specific to one cancer. So nowadays you're having drugs which are tumor agnostic. 
approval in the sense that the same ivocitinib you can even use in acute myeloid leukemia, right? If, if, as long as the tumor has that mutation. You, same thing you can even use it, the same Keras inhibitor you can use it even in lung cancer. So, so even though it's, 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 uh, it's, it seems a little vast, but it's good to kind of go into this molecular genomics because that's, that's where the future is. I mean, gone are the days where we're going to bombard everybody with chemotherapy. Future may be that we're going to find out what is driving your tumor and try and target that in a better way. So these are FGFR inhibitor, right? And uh, you know what are these plots called? What are these plots? What are they called? They call? I mean, epitome. Uh, they call waterfall plots, right? What is waterfall plot? So basically, each of these line, each of these line is a patient, right? Each of these line is a patient, and and this is the baseline, and you draw like this if the tumor increases, you draw like this if the tumor decreases on treatment, right? So if you give this drug, this is infigratinib. These patients who have this FGFR mutation, look at the rest. Look, see, these many patients have regression, and you draw a line here at 25 percent because that is what we call. Uh, I mean, as a definition of response, the tumor should shrink more than 25% to, to be called a response, right? But if the tumor does not shrink 25% but still shrinks a little bit, we call this stable disease, right? Right? So, so if you see the waterfall plots for different drugs, there are the four of those drugs on the screen, and they all actually tell you that this is better than what you get with 5-FU, capecitabine, folfirinox, right? But then, but then, these are just few patients. I mean, this is not a common alteration. So this is not for everybody. But, but the importance of this is you need tissue to do these tests. Right? So when you see your patients in OPD, you're like, oh, anyway, he's got advanced disease. I've got a supraclav node. Let me just do FNAC and send him uh, home or send him to Monk. Right? So, but when he comes to me, I would love to have a block. Why? Because I need to look for all these things. Right? Only if you have a block, you can actually send it to the lab and ask them, can you do an NGS on this? Right? So as, as residents, when you make a diagnosis, try to get a biopsy because biopsy can actually be the difference between your patient living six months versus living two years. Right? So, so that's what I think uh, you should remember. Okay, now another thing which you all should know in, in actually all solid cancers, not only GI cancer, is some, a concept called MMR deficiency. What is MMR? Mismatch repair proteins, right? Mismatch repair proteins is, uh, if you remember your Robbins pathology, uh, there are these genes which are involved in, 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 in the, I mean, of, of all the genes involved in, in your mismatch repair pathway, in, uh, one of the genes, well, actually four of them is called MSH, MLH, PMS, correct? Remember that? Lynch syndrome. Lynch syndrome is common, right? We all read for entrance. What are, all the, what are all the mutations in Lynch syndrome? What happens in Lynch syndrome? People develop multiple polyps in the colon. They have increased incidence of colon cancer, endometrial cancer. So that's the, that's the inherited defect in Lynch syndrome. The same defect can be somatic in many other tumors, not inherited. You don't have Lynch syndrome, but your tumor have mutations which, are, which, are, which is what you see in Lynch syndrome. So these tests are very simple in the sense all these uh, four proteins are available in pathology as IHCs. So if you tell the pathologist, uh, you have the tumor, can you stain for these four proteins? And if you find any of these proteins which are lost, okay, MSH, uh, MLH and PMS, if any of these uh, proteins are lost, it, it, it tells you that this tumor may be deficient in these. The implications for this is, if you have deficiency in these proteins, then what happens is DNA cannot be repaired. And if DNA cannot be repaired, there are thousands and thousands of mutations which keeps accumulating. And when these mutations accumulate, these are like new antigens to your immune system. So your immune system actually is activated. And your immune system can better recognize these tumors. And that can be targeted in terms of treatment. I'll show you what I mean. So, so, so the first question is how common these are, right? Depend, it depends on what cancer you're treating. So if you have, if you're treating endometrial cancer, it, it, could be, it could be as common as 20%. But if you're treating uh, something like a, uh, like a glioblastoma or a breast cancer or a, or a uh, pancholangiocarcinoma, it, is, it could be 3 or 4%. But for those 3 or 4%, it can actually make a big difference. 
I'll show you here. So this is so this is immunotherapy in biliary tract cancer, right? So what is immunotherapy? I think you all know from, from your lung cancer talk and all that, right? You know. <laughs> so these are these are drugs which which target your PD1, PDL1 axis. And, and uh, if you, you, you can look it up. So what they basically do is they help your own T cells to go and recognize tumor antigens and mount an immune response. So if you give these tumors, if you give immunotherapy to biliary tract cancers unselected, see only these patients responded. So you will say, oh, this is not a good treatment. Actually, this is not a good treatment in unselected patients because, because, because majority of them will not benefit. And this is a costly treatment. But on the other hand, if you have an MSI high tumor and you give them immunotherapy, what is that? So this is again the same waterfall plot. So this is just uh, presented last, last month. These are all colon cancer patients who have a tumor. They have not gone for surgery, but because their tumor is MSI high, they were given this drug called uh, uh, nivolumab along with EP. And you see, each patient responded. Response rate is almost uh, 100%. And 67% and, uh, of, pa of patients, when they did surgery, there was no tumor. There was no tumor. And 95% and of the patients have major pathological response that they have defined as only 10% tumor. Okay, so, so, so again, so, so these, are, these are, you may say only 3 to 4% of patients, but you have to look for it. And looking for it doesn't cost money. It just costs some IHC, which they'll give you in two days' time. Right? So, so that's the importance of uh, getting to know these things. Now, we're talking about liver tumors, right? And when, when, it, when, it, when, when at most of the patients may, may not be resectable. When they're not resectable, as, as medicine postgraduates, you're supposed to know what are the liver-directed therapies we have. When you say, when somebody asks you, an examiner asks you, what, is, what are the liver-directed therapies you know? Other than surgery, which is again a liver-directed therapy, what else do we have? We have radiotherapy, which you can do, right? Then you have something called radioembolization. Do you know what is radioembolization? What is radioembolization? Basically, basically, see, when there is something in the liver, you can take advantage of the arterial supply of the liver. Because the arterial supply of the liver is from hepatic artery, but the majority of the blood supply to the liver is through portal vein. Right? So if you inject something in the hepatic artery, it will not go into your systemic circulation. Plus, even if you inject something and you embolize or you block this artery, your liver is not going to die. And your tumors do not derive too much blood from the portal vein. They all derive from the hepatic artery. So using, taking advantage of this, you could actually inject what you want to inject. That could be chemotherapy, that could be just be a bland gel foam just to block the supply. Or you can give particles which are radioactive. And these particles can be very small, very tiny. So they actually go into the tumor microenvironment. And uh, some of these particles are al alpha emitters, they are, they are radio labeled. Right? So this is the concept behind what we call radio. The word radio comes because these are radioactive particles. So it's like an internal kind of selective radiation. Obviously, we use it for tumors which are radiosensitive. If you're going to use it for, uh, for, it, for, a, for a tumor which is like a melanoma, it may not help. Or a colorectal metastasis, it may not help. But if you use it for a hepatocellular carcinoma, it may, it may give you tumor control. So that's something. In addition to this, so, so the same thing, radioembolization can be, can be considered for hepatic tumor. And, uh, and, and uh, there is also another concept called hepatic arterial infusion. That is, you have an implantable device and the catheter tip is an arterial line which is sitting in hepatic artery. Goes from aorta. And you can put pumps like a port and infuse. So those things are done but it's cumbersome so we don't have it here. Okay, so that was biliary tract cancer. Any, any question? Before we go into hepatocellular carcinoma, we have 10 minutes, 10-15 minutes. You all would have diagnosed gallbladder cancers, right? In your wards, in your OPDs? No? Obstructive jaundice patients you would have seen, right? Patients coming with jaundice? Okay. So that's another thing, sir. Like at the triage level, at the triage level, sometimes these people get triaged. 
to jaundice means uh, one particular department. So that, that so that is something we can uh, we can work on. So we we can make, make more diagnosis. Okay, so so we'll just quickly ten minutes. We'll just give you a concept of how do you manage hepatocellular carcinoma. Now you know hepatocellular carcinomas are. What is the risk factor for hepatocellular carcinoma? It usually arises in a diseased liver, a cirrhotic liver. And the risk factor depends on what is the risk factor of cirrhosis in your community, right? In our earlier days, it used to be the viral infections, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Now, hepatitis B, we got it under control. I'm not saying India got it under control, but m most of the world has got it under control by vaccination. Hepatitis C, now we have good uh, treatment available. But many times it is undiagnosed by the time you get, you become cirrhotic. Now the bigger challenge now is obesity and NASH, correct? Okay, and, 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 uh, and, and the other unknown reasons why we have fatty liver, right? So common on ultrasounds you see fatty liver, right? And so this, this, this state of hepatitis is, prob is emerging as a big pandemic actually. And, and, and because of that the, the incidence of cirrhosis and HCCs are likely to rise. If you have a cirrhotic liver, what is important is they should be screened. They should be screened periodically for nodules, which are common, but if there are nodules, then those nodules have to be discussed with the radiologist. And if required, an MRI has to be ordered if there is any suspicion. So ultrasound AFP is, is what you should order for every, uh, you should advise every patient with cirrhosis. And if you have a nodule, you have imaging MRI, and on MRI, they have classifications. There's something called LIRADs, right? LIRADs. So basically, based on how the tumor is appearing, how the tumor is enhancing, tumor characteristics, the radiologist will say uh, cirrhotic nodule or, or, or atypical hyperplasia or possibility of malignancy. Now, this is one cancer where in the past or even now, it's not mandatory to get a biopsy done to make a diagnosis of HCC. If you have a characteristics enhancing pattern, Underlying cirrhosis, high L AFP, these three things put together can tell you this is HCC and you can plan your treatment, right? Now, when I say plan your treatment, most of these patients do not present with extrahepatic disease, right? So, so, but then the important thing to note here is this is one disease where you are dealing with a diseased liver. So, you are actually not treating one cancer, you are treating two, two diseases. One is a cancer, one is a underlying liver which is failing. Right? And how aggressive you can be is determined by the underlying liver. Okay, that's something which, which I see most of people, uh, uh, I mean, don't, do not understand initially. And, and when you're talking to your patient, sometimes you give them too high a hope. Right? And many, and, and many times, if, if you look at causes of death in patients with HCC, most of them die of metastatic disease or liver failure. They all die of liver failure. So sometimes if you're too aggressive in treating the liver, treating the cancer by doing a big surgery or a, a toxic a medical treatment or a big embolization, you can actually worsen the survival. You can cause a decompensation and that's something which you have to avoid. Now, if you have disease limited, so you have this BCLC staging system, okay, that's Barcelona classification of liver disease. So here you have A, B and C and if you have tumors confined to the liver, up to three, each less than three centimeter, you can do liver directed therapies. So you can do microwave ablation, you can do uh, uh, alcohol injection, you can, you can put them on a transplant list. If the underlying liver is good enough to tolerate a resection, you can even resect, right? So, but then if you see that is a small chunk, majority of your patients will actually fall into these two categories, BCLC B or C. By B you mean that the, 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 the veins are not involved, the portal vein is not involved, but the tumor is large, not fit, not suitable for. You can just remember three. Uh, I mean, less, uh, more than three, or more than three centimeters in size. Then, in that situation, what historically what we've been doing is chemoembolization. Now, what is chemoembolization? Is same thing. You put a catheter in the hepatic artery. Uh, you have these uh, beads which can carry some doxorubicin or cisplatin, whatever you want to give, and then you inject and you embolize that. So that was done in the past to keep the cancer stable and improve survival. Now, just in the last 10 years, if you see in terms of medical treatments, all these drugs have come in. Now, you can't read it from the distance, but the first drug to come 
In this disease was a drug called sorafenib. Was a drug called sorafenib and uh, here, so this is on the sharp trial, right? And if you see sorafenib versus placebo, these are all advanced uh, BCLCC and B patients, improved your survival slightly, right? And uh, sorafenib does not have a great response rate, it's a toxic drug. Recently, we have a drug called lenvatinib, which is, which is again, uh, uh, which is again, uh, it, it multi-kinase TKI, but it also has uh, action against FGFR and other pathways. And if you see here, the median overall survival increased to almost 14 months. The, the sharp trial I showed you, median OS was only 6 months. In this trial, the median OS with sorafenib was 12 months. So what it tells you is that the median OS is actually improving in these patients because of better treatment all around, better liver directed therapies, better treatment. And, and, um, and, and if, if you actually see some of the other trials, which is, uh, uh, this is, this is all second line drugs. So once you fail lenvatinib, sorafenib, you have options of regorafenib, cabozantinib, or a drug called ramisurumab. Now if you see immunotherapy in HCC, this is something which has come up recently. And this is a drug, this is a, a drug called atizolizumab with bevacizumab as compared to sorafenib. This is an NEJM paper uh, just four years ago. And, and, and look at the curves. So, th so there, are, there are some patients here the, at the time of publication, the median was not reached. But now I can tell you the median is somewhere around 23, 23, 24 months. So from six months to 12 months, now 23, 24 months, the outcome of this disease has actually changed in the last, in the last about five to six years. Also, I'm saying when you talk about overall survival, just this treatment doesn't matter. What happens to the patients after this treatment? What happens to their liver? What happens to their management of their HCC? Everything. So, so in a nutshell, that, that, that's how you kind of treat uh, HCC, right? You have to keep in mind that you have an underlying disease liver. You have to do everything possible to keep the disease stable in the liver. If it goes out of hand, into the portal vein or outside the liver, then you resort to systemic therapy. Systemic therapy could be TKI alone. Lenvatinib is, if there's one drug you want to remember, just lenvatinib is what you should remember. And if, if, if you have an option of using immunotherapy, which most of us, most of patients actually have now, so, I mean, even, even though the, the kind, of, another thing which you can remember in immunotherapy is the kind of doses which these trials are giving, they probably, that, that high doses may not, be re, may not be required. Like in head and neck cancers, in lung cancers, there are trials, in, in, even from India, even a 20 milligram, one tenth a dose, one tenth a dose can actually also work, right? And, uh, and that's, I think, uh, he, he was looking at low dose immunotherapy for RCCs, right? Yeah, so there are many patients who are actually managing at one tenth a dose at even lesser intervals. So this is like, this is something like, uh, like you do vaccination, right? Booster dose you have to, you, you, may, you may give after two months, you may give after six months, and the activity may still be maintained. Okay, so any, anything on HCCs? Anybody has any doubts on HCC? Any um, HCC you would have diagnosed, right? Hmm? Correct, so, so, so Nitin is asking, can you start immunotherapy based on imaging diagnosis? The answer is yes, if, if you can do, if you can do uh, any treatment based on imaging, because see, why do we start treatment based on imaging diagnosis? Because we know that even if you do the biopsy, the, the, the positive predictive value or the sensitivity does not improve, right? So the, that correlation studies have been done. Okay, but then the other thing is, can we predict which patient is likely to respond better? Okay, and because these are costly treatment, so, so, so to do that you need tumor tissue. But as of now, to treat, you don't need biopsy. But if you want to do some molecular tests, you want to do some translational studies, you want to look at what is the PDL1 expression, what is the tumor mutation burden, it's good if you have a tumor. But here the challenge is if you have ascites, if you have a deranged PTINR, the, it's, I mean, uh, the risk is too high and we don't. Okay. So that's biliary. Now just quickly, five minutes, we will discuss uh, upper GI cancers. 
Now, upper GI cancers, you know, it can actually, it's again not one disease. It can start anywhere in your esophagus, G junction, gastric can be proximal or distal. And depending on where the tumor is, your patients can present with different symptoms, correct? It could be gastric outlet obstruction, it could be dysphagia, it could be odinophagia, it could be just be an anemia. Sometimes it could just, patients come in with Krukenberg tumor and you do an endoscopy, you don't even have an ulcer, but the mucosa looks edematous and you do a biopsy and it shows adenocarcinoma, right? So it could be submucosal, right? So it's, it's got varied presentation. Now what you have to remember is that this is again, this is again a very uh, difficult to treat disease based on the location. If you have, if you have disease in the esophagus, surgery is challenging. Challenging mainly because of how you, how the surgeon is going to anastomose after you resect, right? So if, if the tumor is an upper third, usually surgery is not done, right? And, and even if the disease is not metastatic, it's treated with, the local treatment is going to be radiotherapy, the medical treatment is going to be systemic concurrent chemotherapy, right? If the tumor is in the middle or distal, you have two options. Surgery is the curative treatment, but surgery alone has very poor outcomes. Now, in order to improve on that, you, can, you, have to, you have two options. One is to give chemotherapy and then take for surgery. Other option is a new adjuvant chemo irradiation. So you do weekly chemotherapy, you do six weeks of radiation, let the patient recover, eight weeks later, do an esophagectomy or a, or a, or a Ivor Lewis operation, right? So between the two, there's always a debate between medical oncologists and radiation oncologists, which is better? Is radiation required? Radiation oncologist feels very strongly saying radiation is required. As medical oncologists, we say, okay, no, that doesn't improve, add on to outcome. Our drugs are good enough, right? Now, how do we solve this issue? Solve this issue is to kind of uh, do a randomized trial, which, which is happening. But till now, uh, without that randomized trial, we need to decide, uh, I mean, uh, patient by patient. And many a times, if it's a squamous carcinoma, that's another thing. Most of the biliary tract and all was adeno so far. In esophagus, you can get squamous. If it's squamous carcinoma, radiation probably adds to outcome because they are very radiosensitive tumor. If it's an adenocarcinoma, maybe not so much, not so much. This is just to tell you the survival, uh, the moment the disease goes beyond the, the cirrhosa, right, the, the outcomes drop. And if it goes into the lymph node, the outcomes are even more dismal. So when you have a CT scan, even though the disease is non-metastatic, but you see regional nodes, Right? And also, what is regional node for esophagus? It could be paraesophageal, hilar, and esophagus can actually drain three, three places, right? Even a supraclav node can be a regional node. It may not be a distant node. And, and, and even uh, nodes below the diaphragm can also be regional node, depending on the location of the tumor. Okay, so that's again something which you have to keep in mind. Just because somebody has a supraclav node doesn't become he's got a metastatic disease, right? Depend but then if you got a if you got a G junction and a supraclav node, that's like obviously a distant node. So so if you see, I mean the, again here the 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 improvement in medical treatment actually has happened only in the last ten years. Prior to this, it was mainly radiation. And it was mainly cisplatin and 5-FU. So most of the even esophageal adenocarcinomas would get treated the same way. But the problem in our country is it's even more challenging because how many, how many centers in India you think has a radiation machine which is functional as proportion to the demand we have? Number of patients getting diagnosed with this. What is the waiting list for radiation in Tamil Nadu? Right? Or, 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 and then if you compare that to even some of the other parts, like if you, go, if you go to Bihar or Bengal, that's even worse, right? So many of these patients, actually the outcomes, they just have surgery and nothing else. And with surgery alone, if you see your five years outcome is, is pretty poor, 20, 25%, right? So what happens is that, that uh, initially, uh, maybe about 20 years ago, there was a trial in the US where they did, for this mainly for gastric cancer and then you extrapolate that to esophageal cancer, where they did surgery and then they gave adjuvant chemo RT, right? But that is in a very old one now and now most of, most of the Europe and US now do not do upfront surgery. We all would want to give chemotherapy and chemotherapy here again, it's a GI cancer, the 5FU remains the most important drug. 
The 5-FU can actually be combined with two other drugs, oxaliplatin and T stands for docetaxel or taxane. So here again, platinum, taxane, 5-FU. Three drugs in combination results in better 5-year survival. See, 36%, 38%, 45%. As opposed to giving only, uh, giving only two drugs. This, is, this was only two drugs, right? And this is across trials. We have meta-analysis and all that. Uh, and, and these are the Kaplan Mayer curves showing you the, the extra cure rates by, by adding uh, these medical treatments. Now, what is the data we have with radiation? Uh, the one important trial here is this, this thing called CROSS trial. This trial again was a chemo radiation versus followed by surgery versus surgery alone. And you see there is a similar difference. Now, this trial actually included both squamous and adenome. Okay, and most of that benefit you see is probably due to squamous, right? And, uh, and now if you're looking at head-on comparison, I was telling, you know that we keep debating medical and radiation oncology is what is required. So there is this, there, this trial has been completed. So you give chemotherapy, surgery, chemotherapy versus just do chemo radiation and surgery. And, and, and results of these, if you see, there is hardly any difference in terms of overall survival. So based on this, now radiation is slightly going out of favor for adenocarcinomas, right? And, and, and it's going to be pre-operative chemotherapy followed by surgery. And the surgery depends on the location of the tumor, right? And uh, when these patients have advanced disease, this is again, uh, so if you have a G-junction or a gastric carcinoma which is advanced, that means you got a liver met. How do you approach that patient? Now what I told you is that sim very similar to what we do in other, other cancers, once you have a biopsy, you ask your pathologist to check whether in addition to chemotherapy, can I do something else? And the markers which you check for is IHC for, again, your MMR proteins, HER2, and also there's something called PDL1. Now PDL1, you know what it is, right? PDL1, if it's positive, you can add this drug called immunotherapy, which is nivolumab. So this is a randomized trial. You see about eight, uh, almost, uh, uh, almost uh, 1700 odd patients. And if you add nivolumab to chemotherapy, and if your PDL1 is high, as compared to all randomized, you, you have an absolute difference at two years of almost 19 versus 31 percent number of people who are alive right so 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 that's how that's how we manage esophageal gastric cancer sorry I missed. this is too much to take but thank you thank you Ashish for taking us through all the cancers in the abdomen. Uh, any, any questions? Some of you are looking stunned, but I guess uh, many, of, many of them are our first years. We have two first years, about five or six months apart. So uh, uh, I, I guess uh, as, you, as you reach oncology and go through it slowly, you'll understand the newer concept that has come in. But I guess these are something on the rise that we need to know and something that we need to be aware of. I think some of the principles are laid on. How do you, as an internist, as you see malignancies, what should be our approach? How do you kind of uh, uh, evaluate them? You have to talk, patients will keep nagging you. And of course, you, you should not commit to dogmatic statistics that the oncologist will, but you can at least give them an idea. And the evaluations, investigations, and knowing what are the various parameters that an oncologist are using, <clears throat> to determine the treatment on one side and to explain the prognosis on the other side. So, um, thank you. Thank you, Ashish. Uh, no, and no questions, you guys? Uh, those who have gone through oncology, their questions others may not understand also. So, anyway, so <clears throat> uh, I, I'm sure this is just opening up a whole spectrum of what oncology is all about, is getting quite... Uh, um, structured, very specific, and some of them have excellent outcomes based on some of the marker studies that you do among them. Okay. So thank you, thank you, Ashish, once again. And uh, you have a little cancer-friendly breakfast today. 
I mean, <laughs> we, we didn't talk about things that causes cancer and what can prevent cancers and that's <clears throat> one big area. So, but anyway, all of you are invited to join for the breakfast. Uh, it's ready, yeah? Okay, so you all can join for the breakfast and I guess many of you have to run for your OPDs and other work. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thanks. Thanks, Ashish.